What do you do when you're threatened by one of the most powerful countries in the world, but you're not part of NATO? Looking at a map during the 1960s, Sweden was definitely not in the most favorable position to defend itself from the Soviet threat. But ultimately, the Soviets were kept at bay. And one of the key factors was a jet, which at the time was probably one of, if not, the most advanced fighter jet in the world. It wasn't too expensive, it was easy to maintain, and it was able to quickly take off from pretty much anywhere. And it even chased the infamous SR-71 Blackbird away. Join me today as we uncover the crazy engineering behind the mighty Swedish, uh, duck. This is the Saab 37 Viggen. This video couldn't be made without Squarespace and their design intelligence. Squarespace makes it easy to create a beautiful website, engage your audience, and sell anything from products to content, all in one place, all on your terms. But more on that later. In order to protect your country, you must first protect your skies. This is true today, and it was definitely true during the Cold War. The East and West were constantly trying to dominate each other in aerial warfare. But for one country, air force and air defense was really the imperative for survival. At that time, Sweden wasn't a member of NATO, and the Soviets were an ever-looming threat, so investing into their own aviation was the logical thing to do. In addition to the Saab 32 Lansen, they built the Agile Saab 35 Draken, which we already did a video on. But even before that plane saw service in 1955, research on how to build the next generation fighter had already been started. Sweden simply had to think ahead and outside the box because they obviously didn't have the same resources as Uncle Sam or those dreaded Soviets. They also had an ace up their sleeve, a Finn by the name of Ani Lakuma. Normally, when someone says engine swapping, you think of cars and not planes. But not Lakuma, who became famous during World War II after replacing weaker plane engines with the more powerful ones captured from the Soviets. The Swedes recruited him in 1944, and he was now part of the team researching ways to build the perfect fighter for Sweden. They explored the standard delta wing configurations, as well as the use of canards. They even briefly touched upon a VTOL design, because, well, it was popular at the time, but deemed it to be too expensive and complicated for their domestic jet. As the Draken and Lansen got older, they came up with a new list of requirements for this aircraft. This new jet had to exceed Mach 2, be a better fighter than the competition, remain relatively cheap while being simple to maintain even for minimally trained crews, and have low stall speeds, which is one of the issues its predecessor, the Draken, had faced. The most important requirement, however, was STOL, short takeoff and landings. The Draken was capable of taking off from roads or highways, but this jet needed to take it to the extreme. It had to be able to land and take off from a 500 meter long runway because of something called the BAS-60. Basically, the Swedes knew that if they were attacked, their best chance was to set up several small air bases all around their country, essentially spreading out their forces so they could continue operating even in the event of a large enemy airstrike, because the enemy would never be able to destroy all of their jets at once. But how on earth were they going to achieve this? Well, it's thanks to the good old US of A. In the 1960s, President Eisenhower and the US National Security Council signed a deal with Sweden which guaranteed military aid in the event of a Soviet attack. It's not really known why the US did this. There are theories that it was to protect their Polaris subs located near the coast of Sweden in case of a Soviet attack, but this isn't confirmed. It might just be a case of poking the Reds by making Sweden stronger. But the bottom line was that the Sweden now had advanced aeronautical technology at their disposal, and they were able to create a new plane much faster, with all the bells and whistles of the US military industrial complex. And thus the Saab 37 Viggen was born. I think by this point we can look at the track record of the Swedish and call them masters of design. They make fantastic meatballs, fantastic furniture, and now with the Draken and the next aircraft in the series, the Viggen, they've taken the jet fighter to a whole new level. 
And it's because of this that I can claim that their design was really intelligent. But speaking of intelligence design, we need to talk about the new Squarespace design intelligence. That's right, the amazing Squarespace website creator has combined two decades of industry leading design expertise with cutting edge AI technology to unlock your strongest creative potential. For example, imagine you're making a site to sell cool merch for a YouTube channel, like found and explained dot shop, and you jump onto Squarespace, where it will actually recommend a fantastic design to reach your goals. A beautiful, more personalized website crafted a bespoke digital identity, and it won't look like anybody else's on the web. Say goodbye to templates, the game has changed. But building a website is only the beginning of what Squarespace can do. You can run email campaigns, get more customers, and even launch courses. That's right, if you want to teach, Squarespace is now your one-stop shop for your entire education portal. It's pretty amazing, and I think that I should probably do a Found and Explained Academy very soon in how to build your own fighter jets, just because I want to use these cool new tools. So head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to www.squarespace.com found to save 10% of your first purchase of a website or domain. The Swedes meticulously planned the design of this plane, even down to its name. The name Viggen can actually have two meanings. Firstly, it means thunder, alluding to the sound made by Mjolnir the hammer of the god Thor, fitting for a plane that would rival the might of the Soviets. However, it also means tough to duck. This alludes to the French word for duck, canard, because this plane has a canard, delta configuration. This entire design was pretty radical at the time, featuring an aft-mounted double delted wing with canards that were equipped with powered trailing flaps, mounted ahead and slightly above the main wing. This is because the plane has elevons instead of more conventional control surfaces like flaps and ailerons. Elevons are used in the double delta design, but they add weight at takeoff and landing. So the position of the canards acts as a vortex generator for the main wing and therefore provide more lift. This gives the aircraft that required STOO capability as well as the ability to travel at Mach 2 speeds. Brilliant. A dog tooth was also added to improve the stability at high angles of attack. The airframe itself featured a lot of aluminium, however, titanium was also used for the entire rear section of the fuselage. The landing gear was also strengthened and had anti-skid brakes for those short landings. To allow the plane to carry more weapons, specifically anti-ship missiles, the undercarriage legs shortened during retraction. The vertical stabilizers could also be folded so that the aircraft could be stored in small spaces. Again, this allowed it to operate remotely in the middle of nowhere. But all of this would have been impossible without a proper engine. The designers originally wanted to use a Rolls-Royce Medway engine, but the development of that engine was cancelled. So thanks to the deal that they made with the Americans, they went with a Pratt & Whitney JT-8D engine. It was heavily modified by Volvo and named the Volvo RM8. The modifications included a new afterburner and a fully viable nozzle. Because it also needed to achieve those short landings, it needed a reverse thruster as well. In fact, the RM8 was the first engine to feature an afterburner and a reverse thruster. This thruster could even be used to make the plane go in reverse. And to top it all off, it could be set to automatically engage when the nose wheel strut was compressed, giving the shortest landing possible, even beyond the reaction time of a human. Because maintenance had to be simple, the intakes were simple D section types. But this brought up two issues. The entire thing was very large. In fact, it was the second largest fighter engine in the world at the time behind the R-15. And the second problem was the fact that the intakes were prone to ingesting birds, just like duck. Yummy. But folks, I'm not done. What actually set the Vigan apart was what was under the hood. And this is where this jet gets even crazier. So the Viggen was a single seat, single engine aircraft. That may not seem so strange until you consider that it was developed in the 1960s. How on earth was it going to perform all of those insane tasks with one pilot? The answer was computers. And I'm not talking about the type that take up a whole room. After all, this was the 1960s. 
It was equipped with a digital central computer and a heads-up display that would feed the pilot all of its useful information. So there was no need for a co-pilot. It also reduced costs, so no analog systems were necessary. The CK-37, as the computer was called, was the first airborne computer with integrated circuits. The radar inside the aircraft was also the Ericsson PS-37 X-Band Monopulse Radar. It could provide air-to-ground and air-to-air -air telemetry to search, track, and also have terrain avoidance and cartiography. At this point, I wouldn't even be surprised if it could do my taxes. Apart from the heads-up display, the rest of the displays in the cockpit were mechanical. It also featured a system called AP-12. These were three multi-purpose CRT display screens that showed useful information, such as computer-generated maps, flight and weapons data, among other stuff. You could probably even watch Netflix. Actually, you probably could. Oh, and the ejection seat was also built in-house. It was called the Rakastol 37, which literally meant Rocket Chair 37, and it was the last Saab-designed seat in a fighter. Too bad we never got to see that in a car, James Bond would have loved it. All of this made it one of the most advanced jets in Europe and probably the world when it entered service. And what a service life this aircraft had. First, there were three distinct versions. There was the AJ-37, which was the standard most used variant. Primarily, it was an attack aircraft with a secondary fighter role. There were nine hardpoints, with the centerline hardpoint usually used for a fuel tank, but it could also carry those anti-ship missiles. The plane could also be equipped with smart bombs, air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missiles, making it a true multi-role fighter. For close encounters, it could also carry 30mm Aiden cannon pods. A nuclear and chemical weapon variant was considered, but it was never built. The SK-37 was a two-seater trainer aircraft version that had no radar and a reduced fuel capacity. The SF-37 was a photo reconnaissance aircraft. Again, it didn't have a radar because it was replaced by cameras in the nose. Then there was the SH-37, which was the maritime version. It was commonly equipped with a chaff and jammer pods and of course those anti-ship missiles that the Swedes can't seem to get enough of. But I've been holding out of you because what you guys want to hear about is the upgraded version, which first took flight in 1979, the JA-37. First and foremost, this got a radar upgrade. The Ericsson PS-46A, which with the new RB-71 missiles, gave it a look down, shoot down capability, meaning it could now target cruise missiles and low flying aircraft. The cannon was also upgraded, and now used the KCA 30mm cannon, which fired the same cartridges as the GAU-8, but with beefed up shells. This was paired with a fire control system, giving it better range than other fighters, something that the A-10 Warthog dreamed of. The engine was also given an overhaul, and it was now called the RM-8B. Because it was larger, the airframe had to be stretched a bit to accommodate it, as if the engine couldn't get any bigger. Most importantly, this plane also received the expanded STRLI data link. This meant that it could now communicate with up to three other planes in addition to ground control. Data link information could then be displayed on the HUD system. All of this sounds really good because it was. The pilots love flying it and the engineers love servicing it. You only needed five people with basic training to do it. Heck, they could even refuel and rearm the thing in less than 10 minutes, or replace the entire engine in just four hours. God, this plane was good. It was the perfect plane to protect the skies from the Soviets, but also the Americans. Wait, what? Not only did the Viggen protect Swedish skies, but it also protected its allies. You see, Viggen pilots learned how to intercept the elusive SR-71 Blackbird. Yeah, I'm not holding out on you on this story. They started by predicting its flight path. At first, they couldn't get a lock on, but after tweaking the avionics to bypass the SR-71's countermeasures, they got a lock. Several of them, in fact, and to this day, the Viggen remains the only aircraft, apart from the MiG-31, to do so. Of course, this was all done in a form of a friendly competition with their American counterparts. Sweden was technically neutral, but between the US and the Soviets, they would certainly go with the country that enabled them to build the Viggen in the first place. And they did just this. 
1987, Lieutenant Colonel Dwayne Knoll and Tom Viltry were flying in their SR-71 over the Baltic Sea. One of their engines suddenly exploded and they had to drastically lower their altitude and flew into the Swedish airspace. This left them vulnerable to Soviet MiG-25s, which the Soviets immediately sent after them. One of them probably even got a lock on, although this is debated, but it didn't matter as it couldn't shoot it down because two Swedish Vigans were having a training flight nearby and got to the Blackbird first, so it was now under Swedish escort. The pair was then replaced by two other Vigans and they continued escorting the SR-71 until it landed in Denmark. All in all, this was an amazing jet and is quickly climbing the ranks in my mind as one of the ultimate fighters. But why didn't we see more of it? Well, the Swedes did try exporting it. It entered a competition to replace the US aging F-104 Starfighter, but as we know, the F-16 won that competition. The Vigan was almost sold to India as well, but the US blocked this trade. They didn't really like the idea of the Indian Air Force having access to the licensed RM-8 engine, as well as several other advanced technologies that they wanted to keep out of the Indian hands. In the end, only 329 Vigans were built, and they were later replaced by the JAS-39 Gripen. Today it can be mostly found in museums in France, Poland, Estonia and Sweden, and I had the opportunity to see it personally in Paris, along with our producer Ogien, and that's the moment where I actually got the idea to make this video. But even though it might be obsolete now, it certainly wasn't at the time that it was introduced. It remains one of the most quirky, but also cleverly designed fighters of all time, and it will go on to influence many other successful designs we see in the sky today. Let me know if you want me to cover the final chapter in this Swedish trilogy with the latest Swedish fighter, the Gripen, or if there's any other projects that you want me to cover on the channel. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.